Oral questions. Questions orales. The Honourable Chef. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Le Conseil Municipal. The Mayor and City Council of Montreal have requested legalization of hard drugs in their communities. Will the Prime Minister openly acknowledge the deadly mistake that legalizing hard drugs was in BC, or is he going to try to repeat this problem in Montreal? The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, BC requested a pilot project and we worked with them. We agreed to amend the deal with them to better meet their needs. And we will always be there to work respectfully and with respect for science with our partners. But we weren't going to go ahead with any project without the support of the provinces involved. And the leader of the opposition knows that full well. But he can he keeps on his ideological path, like Stephen Harper, even though that was rejected as immoral and obsolete. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Believe in the decriminalization of crack in children's parks, meth smoking in hospitals, or other hard drugs on public transit. Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We believe in working with British Columbia and with any province that wants us to work with them on this, which is why we accepted their request to modify uh, their pilot project on exactly uh, those issues. Uh, this is something we will continue to do to work in a basis of science around compassion and uh, a medical approach, a health approach, uh, not a criminal justice approach, uh, to dealing with the toxic drug supply and uh, addictions. At the same time, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we won't be taking lessons from the Conservatives that continue to chase after a Harper-era uh, policy that their, their own advisers said was obsolete. The Honourable Leader at the Opposition. It's an important question, Mr. Speaker, because we need to know what he's going to do next. I just gave him a chance to indicate whether he believes people should be allowed to smoke crack in children's soccer fields or meth in the faces of nurses in hospital rooms. He refused to answer, which begs the question of whether or not he will try to impose the same radical and extremist policy elsewhere. So once again, does he believe that people should be allowed to smoke meth or crack in children's soccer fields? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Speaker, obviously no one in this House does. That is why we agreed with the British Columbia government to modify their pilot project to better suit their concerns. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, uh, we've seen the extent to which the Leader of the Opposition will continue to try and use tragedies uh, and ongoing challenges Canadians and vulnerable people are facing to try and score political points. Uh, it's the same reason he's uh, said that he will suspend people's fundamental rights and freedoms to score cheap political points. That is not something that Canadians want to see, Mr. Speaker. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister legalized the use of hard drugs like meth, crack uh, and heroin in children's parks and in hospitals, and he won't rule out doing it again. This is not an academic question. The City of Toronto submitted a 153-page application, and I quote, seeking an exemption under Section 56.1 of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act that would decriminalize personal possession of illicit substances within Toronto's boundaries. The Prime Minister's government has been working secretly with Toronto on that plan ever since. Will he, yes or no, rule out decriminalization in Canada's biggest city? Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, once again, we see the Leader of the Opposition trying to score cheap political points on the backs of uh, vulnerable people to promote an ideology that does not work. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to be there uh, with a thoughtful, compassionate-based uh, public health approach on the toxic drug supply, and that means working with jurisdictions. When Vancouver asked us for an exemption, we said no. We would only work with the province, and that's what we did to work with BC. The same thing when it comes to Ontario or Quebec, we will only work with the provinces to ensure uh, any projects they have go The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So he refuses to rule out repeating this da disastrous experiment that killed 2,500 British Columbians because he strongly supports decriminalization and if he got a chance, he would do it all over again in Toronto, in Montreal, and anywhere else. Mr. Speaker, the final question, therefore, is even the radical NDP government in B.C. asked for him to reverse his decriminalization. Why did it take him 10 days and 66 more deaths to do it? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Again, Mr. Speaker, we see the extent to which the Leader of the Opposition will uh, make uh, attacks on the political attacks on the backs of the most vulnerable people in this country. We actually only received the completed request from British Columbia uh, Friday uh, last week and uh, approved it the following Monday, three days later, Mr. Speaker. We will always respond quickly uh, in a science based way when people's lives are on the line. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition Opposition is continuing to spread falsehoods, Mr. Speaker, instead of actually following the facts and caring for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have a hard time believing their own commitment to the French language. It's in their culture, but the Prime Minister is responsible for allowing his members to play such dangerous games with our national language. Will the Prime Minister at least request the member the, that the member step down from the, uh, the Association of the Francophonie, the Right Honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, defending both of our official languages is a fundamental pillar of the Liberal Party of Canada's policy. And we were the first to recognize that the federal government also has a specific responsibility for protecting French, even within Quebec. We will always be there to defend the French language and to defend language minorities all across the country. I understand that the bloc keeps trying to pick fights. Sometimes they manage to pick one. But we are going to continue to fight every day for official language minorities. The, the Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. The Prime Minister is really unaware of the political cost of his last answer. The member who is the chair of the Francophonie Association should step down and has refused to apologize for what he said is, in his opinion, uh, those defending French are extremists, and it shows extreme contempt. Will the Prime Minister call on the member in question to step down from his position? The member for Glengarry Prescott Russell should step down. The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, Canada is a proud partner in the Francophonie, and we show that. Unlike the Bloc, we stand for protecting French all across the country. We're not just isolating Quebec. We're recognizing that the French language needs support and protection all across the country. And yes, sometimes we might uh, get a little excited about it, but we're not trying to pick fights. We're always there to defend minority communities, and we will show leadership all across the world as a proud member of the Francophonie. Have the, the Honourable Member for New Westminster Burnaby. 
the liberals hold things up and the conservatives block them. Everything's more expensive for people. Thanks to the NDP, free diabetes drugs will help lower costs for millions of people all across the country. It's shameful that the conservative leader would take that all away from people. The conservatives want more money in the pockets of big pharma and less in the pockets of Canadians. Will the government work with us to defeat this cruel conservative attempt to block free diabetes drugs? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we're very pleased to work with whomever in the House to ensure Canadians no longer have to choose between groceries and medications. Yes, we're moving ahead with free diabetes drugs, but perhaps today we learned why the Conservatives are so fiercely opposed, and that's because their anti-choice leader is allowing anti-choice members to vote against contraceptives and the the morning after pill. We need to f continue to fight hard against that agenda. The Honourable Member from Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Speaker, Canadians will not have free diabetes and birth control if it was up to the Conservative leader. And the Liberals, they keep delaying protecting women's rights. Reproductive rights are human rights, which includes barrier-free access to birth control. Unfortunately, this Conservative leader once again is attacking reproductive rights by blocking access to free contraception. Will the Liberals help us stop the Conservative leader and his anti-choice agenda and their efforts to deny free birth control. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we are happy to work with everyone in this House to stand against the Leader of the Opposition's anti-choice that position and his anti-choice party. We saw yet again today uh, one of his anti-choice members putting forward uh, an anti-abortion uh, narrative. Uh, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, we are delivering uh, prescription contraceptives for Canadians right across the country. We'll deliver diabetes medication for Canadians right across the country for free. We're happy to work with the NDP and anyone in this House who wants to stand up for Canadians and for women's rights unequivocally. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. If you're under 30 in Canada, it's nothing but doom and gloom, according to Bloomberg Nanos. Gen Z's confidence in their pocketbooks is at the same level that it was in the first months of the pandemic. That's a 16-year low. The budget they said was about generational fairness has turned out to be a monumental failure. Instead, young Canadians keep getting higher spending, higher inflation, and higher interest rates, and they get nothing for it. The Prime Minister was voted in by young Canadians. Why won't he admit that he's destroyed their futures? step aside and let Conservatives fix everything he broke. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, our budget is about generational fairness and investing in young Canadians, investing in the housing, in the affordability and the economic growth that they urgently need. But you know what else young Canadians need, especially young Canadian women? That is control over their bodies. You get that control with free, co free prescription contraceptives. The Conservatives are voting against our budget because they don't believe that a woman, a young woman, should control her life and her body. We won't let them do that. Excellent. I'm certain all members would like to hear the question for the member of Thornhill without interruption and also hear the answers. I'll ask all members to please do so. The Honourable Member from Thornhill. So cherry-picking data, misinformation and lecturing Canadians, telling them that they are on they are wrong. That is a choice, Mr. Speaker. Millennials are telling this government that they can't pay their rent, that they can't pay for groceries, that they can't get to work. Even the bank governor confirmed that $61 billion in new spending is, quote, not helpful when it comes to bringing down inflation and interest rates. When will the Deputy Prime Minister stop 
her inflationary spending so that young people stand a chance in this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. I notice, Mr. Speaker, that the Deputy Leader of the Conservative Party did not clarify her own position on a woman's right to choose. Canadian women deserve to know. And you know what? They can't trust any of these Conservatives to actually tell the truth. Because the Governor of the Bank of Canada, in fact, said our budget was helpful because we stuck to our fiscal guardrails. That is what he said, Mr. Speaker, despite Conservative attempts to portray it otherwise. The Honourable Member from Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. After nine years of this NDP Liberal government, interest on our national debt is more than we spend on health care. The Prime Minister is spending more money lining the pockets of wealthy bankers and bondholders than making sure Canadians get the health care they need. On Thursday, the bank governor told the Finance Committee that government spending was not helpful in bringing down inflation and interest rates. When will the Prime Minister finally start listening, get spending under control to bring down inflation and interest rates? Here, here. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, Yet again, just basic disinformation from the Conservatives. What the Governor of the Bank of Canada said to the Finance Committee last week, and I quote, speaking about our budget, I don't expect it is going to have a significant macro impact relative to our previous fiscal forecast. He said that meeting the fiscal guardrails is helpful. And Mr. Speaker, Moody's has reaffirmed our triple A rating. These are not partisans. Our budget is fiscally responsible. They're simply not telling the truth. The Honourable Member from Charleswood St. James, Assiniboia Headingley. The Prime Minister is just not worth the cost of housing. On Thursday, the bank governor also told the Finance Committee that housing will continue to be unaffordable into the future. Shame. After nine years, the Prime Minister has destroyed the dream of home ownership in this country. Sure, they talk a big game, spending billions, but the results are double trouble. Housing prices, double. Mortgage payments, double. Rents, double. Can't they just get out of the way before things double again? Yeah. Oh. The Honourable Minister for Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, it's difficult to accept criticisms from the Conservative Party when it comes to housing, when both their record and their plan de demonstrate they have no interest in solving the housing crisis. They're now campaigning on a commitment to cut funding for the programs that actually support home construction. They're campaigning on a commitment to raise taxes on new apartment construction that's going to help make sure apartments are available at prices that people can actually afford. And if you look at the record of the Conservative leader, while he had the responsibility for the housing portfolio, he got a total of six affordable housing units built across the entire country. Here, here. Have the the Honourable Member for Bellechasse, Les Echemins, Lévis. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. After nine years of this Liberal government, Canadians just can't cope. The, government, the Governor of the Bank of Canada says this Prime Minister's reckless spending is making it hard to lower interest rates. Canadians are struggling to feed and house themselves, and the Bloc keeps encouraging the Prime Minister to waste their money. When will this block-backed Prime Minister stop impoverishing Canadians with his inflationary policies and devastating spending? The Honourable Minister of Public Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm very happy to hear my colleague from Lévis talking about housing. The good news is, or the right answer, is that the Conservatives built a total of six housing units during their entire term all across the country. The good news is, thanks to our work, is that there are 205 affordable units that have been built in her riding in recent months. That's great news for the member, but not so good for the Conservative leader as former housing minister. The Honourable Member for bellechasse les echemins lévis it's disappointing to see how out of touch they are. Quebecers are faced with humiliating choices, food or housing, toilet paper or toothpaste, soap or deodorant. 
Mr. Speaker, this is 2024. In a country like Canada, Quebecers and Canadians deserve better. The Bloc and the Prime Minister are not worth the cost. Can they show a little humanity toward Quebecers and stop forcing hunger, homelessness and poverty on them? They're laughing on the other side, Mr. Speaker. It's shameful. The Honourable Minister of Fish, Fisheries and Oceans. Mr. Speaker, it's incredible to hear my colleague on the other side who can't even support our budget. It's not complicated. Their approach is cut, 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 cut to dental care, cut to help for families and children, cuts to seniors. Chop, 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 Mr. Speaker. That's all they know how to do. <laughs> The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Mr. Speaker, they just can't help themselves. Yesterday in committee, the Liberals showed what they really think about protecting the French language. According to the Liberals, people who are concerned about the anglicization of Montreal are extremists who deserve crude insults that don't need repeating here. That's how the Liberals treated witnesses yesterday who were talking about the future of French. Is that the government's official position, or was the member just saying out loud what many Liberals are secretly thinking? Have the Honourable Minister of Employment. Mr. Speaker, as my colleague knows full well, French is in decline all across Canada, including in Quebec. This is an issue we take very seriously. Our government was the first federal government to recognize the decline of French all across Canada. Mr. Speaker, as a proud Franco-Albertan, we are there to promote French all across the country and in Quebec, period. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. Yesterday's insults send quite a message to Quebecers. To the Liberals, if you're concerned about the future of French in Quebec, you're an extremist and you deserve to be insulted. But yesterday's discussion was actually about data from StatsCan. They're not extremists, but their numbers are extremely worrying for the future of our national language. So the people who care about French in Quebec are full of just one thing, actually, common sense. What's the Liberals' problem with the future of French in Quebec? The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker. Merci, Monsieur Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. They should stop tearing up their shirts about the future of French because the Liberal country has been clear for a long time about that. We will stand to protect French in Quebec and all across the country. And not only as a government here in Canada, unlike what the Conservatives might say, we're also doing it internationally. And we have a Canadian in charge of the uh, Association of the Francophonie, and we're very proud of the member of Glengarry from for Glengarry Prescott Russell. We're very proud of his work. Hello. Order, order, please. The Honourable Member for La Pointe de Lille. This isn't the first time the Liberals have gone off script. Remember the member for Saint Laurent who claimed Bill, C Bill 96 would prevent Anglophones from getting health care in Quebec. Or the members from the West Island who threatened to vote against their own official languages reform if it gave French more protection in Quebec. Or the Liberals' pride in all their unilingual English appointments. The same Liberals who appointed a Governor-General who still doesn't speak French. Why are the Liberals so hostile toward protecting French? The Honourable Minister of Transport. Mr. Speaker, 
I'm not sure what is the problem with the member opposite, but our colleague is a proud defender of French, not just in Quebec, but all across Canada, whereas the bloc couldn't give a hoot about that. We have financed the protection of French to the highest level of any government, and the bloc has consistently voted against it. They're voting against what we're doing, whereas we have our benches standing up for French all across Canada. Honourable member for Lévis-Lotte-Pinière. Mr. Speaker, after nine years, the Prime Minister and the bloc aren't worth it. The more the government spends backed by the bloc, the more Quebecers struggle. The housing crisis will soon force Canadians to live, through no fault of their own, in their minivans as a last resort, not as their retirement dream. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister, backed by the bloc, with $500 billion in budget appropriations, when will they stop wasting money so Quebecers can once again live with dignity under the roof of a house, not of their minivans? Once again, I'd like to encourage all members to remain silent when a member is asking a question and obviously when the answer is given. The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, Canadians will not be lectured by the Conservatives and their support for extremist groups in Canada. Canadians know they're a party with no vision, no ambition, and no plan either for this country. Here on this side of the House, we know that we need to help families, we need to invest in housing, but you know what? People are seeing that members opposite have voted against support for children, for housing, and for investments in Quebec. It's shameful. Here on this side, we will always fight to improve Canadians' quality of living. The Honourable Member for lévis lotte Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government hasn't built any housing. They've just built more bureaucracy with $500 billion in centralizing and inflationary spending that created this cost-of-living crisis and the housing crisis we're currently in. Mr. Speaker, with thousands of Canadians in dire straits, will the Prime Minister see to it that housing is built quickly? When you're at the point where you're sleeping in your van or your car, it's because this Prime Minister is asleep on the job! <laughs> Minister of National Revenue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. While my colleague practices his uh, performance for InfoMan, we are doing what needs doing with the fund to help young people save up for their first down payment. 650,000 young people have signed up for that and they have saved $2.6 billion that way. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, after nine years of this government, Canada's housing crisis has only gotten worse. The dream of buying a home is dead for an entire generation. Proof that the bloc and this Prime Minister aren't worth the cost. In Bose, families luckily en lucky enough to have affordable housing still have to go to food banks to feed themselves, a 20 percent increase in use since the start of 2024. When will this block back Prime Minister stop wasting money so Quebecers can find decent housing and food? Have the Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Six units of affordable housing were built under the uh, Conservative leader's tenure as Minister of Housing. But I'm glad they asked that question because he's a former mayor of a municipality in Quebec. And he, the leader, the Conservative leader, has basically called all uh, Quebec municipalities incompetent. The Honourable Member for both. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, my colleague across the way should come visit both this weekend and explain that to our people. Now, the more this government spends, the more Quebecers are suffering. 
We're talking about $500 billion in centralizing and inflationary spending that is exacerbating the housing crisis. While Quebecers are trying to survive, the Bloc Québécois has chosen to vote in favor of $500 billion in Liberal budget appropriations. That means they're voting for bureaucracy and for waste. When will this government get out of the way so that Conservatives can fix the budget and build the homes? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party are using vulnerable Canadians for their own political purposes. That's not acceptable. Mr. Speaker, through our national housing strategy, we are creating over 150,000 more units of affordable housing. Now, just for comparison, Mr. Speaker, Six units of affordable housing were built from coast to coast when the leader of the opposition was Minister of Housing. That was unacceptable. We are investing in building affordable housing in Quebec and elsewhere in Canada. Once again, I ask the member for portneuf jacquartier and the member for Bécantique lérable to please wait to be uh, recognized by the chair before speaking. Over east. During the inquiry, concerns around the participation of busloads of Chinese foreign students and falsified documents for the Don Valley North nomination came to light. The commissioner noted that Chinese foreign interference activities could have made a difference on who was nominated in Don Valley North. The Chinese media reported that the nomination was won by 14 votes. The Prime Minister cannot continue to pretend there is nothing to see here. Based on the damning findings, what action will the Prime Minister take now? The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, I thank our colleague for the question, and far from not taking this matter seriously, our government has done the exact opposite. Our colleague knows well we have put in place a series of measures now over a number of years to deal with the very real threat that she identified <coughs> of the Chinese government seeking to interfere in the democratic process in Canada. All political parties, and not just at the federal level, Mr. Speaker, uh, face this threat. That's why yesterday, for example, we introduced important legislation in this House, and we look forward to working with colleagues to hopefully pass it quickly. The Honourable Member from Nunavut. People in Nunavut pay hundreds of more dollars in shipping fees than the rest of Canada. Amazon charged a Pangnuktuk resident over $700 in shipping fees. This is unacceptable. The Liberals are catering to ultra-rich corporations by allowing this. Nunavut needs a government that fights to take on Amazon's corporate greed. Why is this government okay with Nunavut paying hundreds more in shipping fees to go to basic goods? Here, here. The Honourable Minister for Northern Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, I, and I thank the member for a very important question. Uh, we realize that the price of food is too expensive in Nunavut. Uh, that's why we've invested close to $150 million in the Nutrition North program, including $124 million for the, uh, the Harvester Support Grant, uh, $15 million for the Community Foods programs. We have a billion dollars for the School Foods programs, which will benefit Northerners in Nunavut. We are committed to working with the member and with the Nunavut government to, to, to make sure we make progress on this very important issue. The Honourable Member for Saint Laurent made his position clear. If he is Prime Minister, he will pick and choose which rights and freedoms Canadians can have. That's a slippery slope, Mr. Speaker. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the United States, est-ce que les femmes canadiennes doivent s'inquiéter de savoir... Do Canadian women need to be worried about whether they will be deprived of their right to choose? Can the Minister remind this House of our commitment to defending women's rights? The Honourable Minister for Women and Gender Equality. Merci pour la... 
Thank you for the question. The question is unwavering, Mr. Speaker. We will all, always, always vigorously support a woman's right to choose, her right to have autonomy over her own body. Conservatives say they will use any tools necessary when it comes to a matter of criminal justice. It wasn't long ago that abortion itself was a crime. We will not go back, Mr. Speaker, even though just this morning a Conservative MP reminded us the future they want for women in this country. On this side of the House, a woman's right to choose will never be up for debate. The Honourable Member from Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. After nine years, this NDP Liberal Prime Minister is not worth the crime, chaos, cost or disorder. 66 people died on average while we waited for this Prime Minister to make a decision on BC's request. The government dithered and people died. The government didn't even go as far as it could have in getting rid of its aggressive, radical and wacko legalization of hard drugs. Why did it take this government so long to reverse its course on legalization and will it promise never to do it again? The Honourable Government House here. Well, of course, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister dealt with that thoroughly earlier in this question period, and we've amended our arrangement with British Columbia. But that member needs to answer a very important question. The Leader of the Opposition has now vowed, vowed to have an a la carte Charter of Rights, That's where right. today he will decide what rights to have and what rights to not have. What will it be tomorrow, Mr. Speaker? Will it be women's reproductive rights? Will it be the right to a fair trial? Will it be the right to freedom of expression? The notwithstanding charter-ripping policies of this Conservative Party need an answer. The Honourable Member from Pitt Meadows, Maple Ridge. After nine years, this Liberal NDP Prime Minister is not worth the crime, chaos, drugs and disorder. Across British Columbia, there's people strung out on drugs, often comatose or dying. The legalization of fentanyl, meth and crack has led to a tragic wave of death. The Liberals and NDP are panicking as their poll numbers drop. The public is fed up. Deadly hard drugs will still be able to use with today's announcement. When will this Prime Minister stop tinkering and completely end his wacko drug experiment? The Honourable Minister for Mental The Honourable President of the Treasury Board. I thank the Honourable Member for the question, but I must remind him that that question was already answered. And on this side of the House, what we want to emphasize is that a woman's right to choose and charter rights generally are non-negotiable. On this side of the House, we will always protect the Charter of Rights of Freedoms. We will always stand up for a woman's right to choose, and we ask everybody in this House to vote in favour of contraception for women so they have autonomy over their own bodies. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Kelowna Lake Country. Mr. Speaker, after nine years, this NDP Liberal Prime Minister is not worth the crime, chaos, drugs and disorder. The Liberal Minister responsible for the legislation of hard drugs like fentanyl, meth and crack in British Columbia is still clinging to parts of the Liberals' wacko hard drug legislation experiment. Public open drug use is rampant in our streets. People are even afraid to take their dogs out to walk around their own neighbourhoods. On what day will the Prime Minister complain completely end this failed radical drug policy. The Honourable Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, let me be clear. Today we said yes to BC's request for an amendment to their pilot project. The pilot program that BC asked the federal government yes, to work did. with them with compassion, conviction, science and health expertise, Mr. Speaker. BC knows perfectly well, as the advocates and families who are part of this project, that we need to have a public health and public safety approach to this to save lives. The Honourable Member from Kelowna Lake Country. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, that minister is still supporting hard drug legalization. And here's how it's playing out in our communities. A resident from my community just told me about an incident she witnessed at a local clothing store where a man threatened the two ladies working there, screaming, stomping, and overturning displays. I was on the phone the other day with another resident who works at a uh, street front office, and I could barely hear her due to the screaming just outside her window. And yet this minister clings to parts of her wacko legalization policy of, of fentanyl, meth, and crack. Again, on what day will the Prime Minister completely end this failed drug policy experiment? Before we continue with the answer from the uh, government health leader, I'm going to ask the Alma member from New Westminster, Burnaby, please to uh, not comment while members are asking the question. He doesn't have the floor at this time. The Honourable Government House Leader. Speaker, of course the Minister and the Prime Minister have dealt with that question, but what is important is to review the, the past couple of weeks, a very disturbing trend in this country, Mr. Speaker, where the Leader of the Opposition has refused to disavow, to say it's unwelcome to have the support of white supremacists. Then he goes and winks and says, I will make the laws and I decide what rights exist in this country, right. what rights are, is he going to take away, <laughs> what rights does he intend to take away, is it women's reproductive rights, is it the right to freedom of expression? Stand up and tell us what rights you take away. Colleagues, the amount of time that the Speaker has to spend getting up to asking members to don't have the floor to please not take the, take the floor uh, is almost equivalent to a question. I would like members, please, to make sure that we could have our question period uh, move along quickly, that members please refrain from speaking when the members are asking questions and that members refrain from speaking when a member is answering questions. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, when CBC Radio Canada CEO Catherine Tate decided to cut 600 jobs in the fall, she wanted to cut as many on the French side as on the English side without taking into account their respective performance or number of employees. Now she's talking about combining the programming and management of CBC and Radio Canada because she wants to use Radio Canada as a shield against possible conservative cuts at CBC. Always in the best interest of CBC, never in the best interest of Radio Canada. Is the minister also ready to sacrifice Radio Canada's independence in order to preserve the CBC? The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I will repeat what I've been repeating since we started talking about this matter. French language programming and content will never be twinned with CBC. Radio Canada will remain independent and distinct. That is important for Francophones in Quebec and everywhere in Canada. On this side of the House, we will defend our public broadcaster in Quebec and everywhere else in Canada. Our public broadcaster is so important, especially in these times when media institutions are making cuts. CBC and Radio Canada are both essential in Canada, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Drummond. Mr. Speaker, the only thing that poses a threat to Radio Canada imminently is not the election of the Conservatives, it's the CEO of CBC Radio Canada, Catherine Tate, appointed and extended by the Liberals. She's prepared to sacrifice the independence of the French language network as a safeguard against a future government. When we warn that this is a slippery slope and that we need to protect Radio Canada's independence, the minister tells us that we're going after the CBC, just like the Conservatives do. That's nonsense. So whose side is the minister on? Catherine Tate's or Radio Canada's? Not have minister, Patrick. The Honourable Minister of Canadian Heritage. Mr. Speaker, I do not understand why my bloc colleague is picking a fight um, about a topic that we all agree on in this House, all parties in this House agree, except the Conservatives. Everyone in this House, except for the Conservatives, defends a strong Radio Canada with a strong financial situation. We also all depend a strong CBC throughout the country with a strong financial situation. We're going to continue to work towards that. Meanwhile, the Conservatives are promising to destroy our public broadcaster and prevent Canadians from having access to information and to quality Canadian content. It's despicable, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member. Order, please. The Honourable Member from South Surrey, White Rock. 
After nine years, does the Prime Minister care that 42,000 Canadians have died from drug overdose? Taxpayer-funded supply of hard drugs has destroyed lives. Addiction workers confirm that most users of so-called safe supply are diverting these drugs into the hands of organized crime. Criminals are selling these drugs to children. Overdose is the number one cause of death in 10 to 17-year-olds in B.C. When will this Prime Minister end this dangerous drug trafficking experiment that profits Big Pharma and kills children? The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, that question has been asked and answered. But I'll tell you what hasn't been answered, Mr. Speaker, that deeply concerns Canadians. It is that over the past few weeks we have seen the leader of the Conservative Party openly associate with white supremacists and refuse multiple opportunities to disavow their views. Then we saw him advocate an a la carte charter of rights and say he would pick which rights people have. And today we learned one right they do not support, a woman's right to choose. This is deeply concerning, Mr. Speaker. Canadians have a right to know. Here, here. Although the uh, members were relatively restrained, it's difficult for the Speaker to hear the answer. If, if there are discussions going on, if people would like me to be very mindful of terms of what the question is saying. The Honourable Member from South, uh, uh, South Surrey, White Rock. Uh, well, thank you. Well, Canadians have the right to know when the RCMP are sounding the alarm why organized crime is getting their hands on these so-called safe supply drugs and diverting them. Thousands of these big pharma government pills have been seized. Organized crime is profiting from selling taxpayer-funded drugs to children. And no, this has not been answered yet today. But the NDP Liberal government is refusing to release the contracts that distribute these drugs. Canadians deserve to know how and why their money is being used. When will the Prime Minister release the big pharma contracts? Just the date, please. Yeah. Honourable Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, that question has been asked and answered. But I'll tell you what the Conservatives really don't want to answer. They don't want to answer why their leader openly flirts with white supremacists and refuses several opportunities to disavow them. They don't want to answer why their leader openly talks about an a la carte <laughs> charter of rights. And today was the big reveal, Mr. Speaker, that one of the rights they're going to take away is a woman's right to choose. But we will not let them. The Honourable Member for Charlebourg, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, Hard drug use has become commonplace in the Montreal metro. There are assault, drug use and homelessness, and it's a scourge in the metro. Riders feel unsafe. It's as if everything that's happening on the surface, the housing crisis, inflation, the opioid crisis, mental health problems, is causing repercussions in Montreal's underground. Can the Prime Minister guarantee that he will ignore the bloc's calls and not decriminalize hard drugs in Quebec? The Honourable Minister of Global Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, colleagues have asked this question countless times, and it's been answered countless times. The leader of the opposition won his leadership race by ensuring that he had the votes of Maxime Bernier supporters and extreme right supporters, as well as those who are against abortion. Those people voted for him. Now he refuses to condemn white supremacists and their ideas. He is here, and one of his members is, in fact, making anti-abortion statements right here on the floor of this place. The Honourable Member from Brampton South. Mr. Speaker, this is a mental health week, and in a rapidly changing world, strong mental supports for youth is essential. By working with my youth council and stakeholders, I know mental health challenges faced by young people. There are many organizations doing incredible work to make sure youth do not fall through the cracks. Can the Minister of Mental and Addiction tell us what we are doing to support community organizations across the country in delivering more mental health 
care option for you? Good question. The Honourable Minister for Mental Health and Addictions. I want to thank the Honourable Member for her question. Yes, Mr. Speaker, youth are facing real challenges right now at home, in school, and as they start their careers. Their mental health can suffer, and community organizations like the South Asian Canadian Health and Social Services in the Member's riding are such a lifeline for support. We're creating a first-of-its-kind youth mental health fund to deliver more mental health supports and care choices for youth and communities across this country. We know they need it. We will be there for them. We're investing in Kids Help Phone and the Mental Health Black Canadians Fund because we know we need to meet people where they are. Mental health is health. The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, at committee, the Minister of Employment claimed that he had been cleared by the Ethics Commissioner to receive payments from Navis Group a firm owned by his business partner that was lobbying his own department. Except that that isn't true. The Office of the Ethics Commissioner has indicated that they were unaware of the Minister's connection to Navis Group. So why did the Minister claim that he was cleared when clearly he had not been cleared? Why did the Minister mislead committee? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Minister has answered these questions many times, and the Minister, of course, complies with all of the very stringent requirements of the Conflicts and Ethics Commissioner. What that member needs to answer is how will he approach this new a la carte rights campaign by the Leader of the Opposition? Which of the rights in the Charter of Rights, 42 years old, Mr. Speaker, is this member intending to take away? We know the Conservatives have always hated the Charter of Rights. Mr. Speaker, which rights will they be taking away? Excellent. The Honourable Member from St. Albert, Edmonton. Mr. Speaker, the Minister actively concealed his connection to Navis Group, hiding behind a numbered company. As a result, the Ethics Commissioner could not have known that the Minister's business partner was lobbying his own department. If there are no ethical issues with the Minister's connection to Navis Group, as the Minister claims, then why did he hide it from the Ethics Commissioner? The Honourable Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives are quite understandably taking this very red herring to try and distract from a very bad couple of weeks. What they have done is refused. I'm going to ask the honourable members, please, to allow the Honourable Minister to finish his uh, question. He's about 24 seconds left on the clock. The Conservatives are quite understandably trying to distract <laughs> from the fact that they refuse to tell white supremacists that their support is unwelcome in the Conservative Party. They're trying to distract from the fact, Mr. Speaker, that they have always hated the Charter of Rights. They have always hated a woman's right to choose. They have always hated the right to free expression in this country. They and explain themselves. The Honourable Member from Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, behold, the ghost of Paul Martin is back. When a government is drowning, they will grasp onto anything, but they continue to sink nonetheless. Yeah. Now, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, six oh, years right. ago, the House and yeah. the government voted to list the IRGC as a terrorist organization and therefore prevent them from fundraising, recruiting, or operating in Canada. Six years later, this terrorist group continues to operate here with impunity. Tomorrow, the House will vote again. Will this NDP Liberal government finally do what they failed to do six years ago and vote to shut down IRGC operations in Canada. Yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, uh, as my colleague knows very well, uh, decisions uh, to list certain entities on the terrorist uh, listing under Canada's criminal code are made based on the advice of security and intelligence services. We do acknowledge, and I think all Canadians understand, that the Iranian regime is one of the worst state sponsors of terrorism. We have taken a number of measures to deal with 
yes. leaders in the Iranian regime, and we're always looking, Mr. Speaker, at what further steps we can take to protect Canadians. The Honourable Member from Scarborough Aged Court. Speaker, we have launched and improved immigration pathways for Hong Kongers to make it easier for them to stay and work in Canada. However, applicants are at risk of falling out of status as they await a decision on their PR application. Canada has always stood shoulder to shoulder with the people of Hong Kong. What is our government doing to help them out get out of precarious situations? The Honourable Minister for Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member for Scarborough Asian Corps for her tireless advocacy on this matter. Hong Kongers that are here are safe, and we have no intention, absolutely no intention, of sending them back. Uh, I am pleased to announce today that we'll be announcing as of May 22nd that Hong Kongers that are here that have valid status will be able to apply for a three year open work permit while they wait for their permanent residency. This is an important measure. We stand, we will continue to stand with the people of Hong Kong. Bravo. The Honourable Member from Nanaimo, Lady Smith. Mr. Speaker, despite Liberal promises to get open net fish farms full of Atlantic salmon out of West Coast waters, the Minister sits idly by. To make matters worse, consecutive Liberal and Conservative governments have been muzzling scientists, whose findings show the extent of the damages. It's not surprising to learn that the Public Sector Integrity Commissioner is now investigating more gross allegations. Will the Liberals cooperate, publish scientists' findings, and finally put coastal communities ahead of corporate profits? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Fisheries and Oceans. To developing a responsible, tent, responsible transition plan for open net aquaculture. We continue to work on a transition plan that protects Pacific salmon while providing support to workers and their communities and advancing reconciliation. Fisheries and Ocean Canada, along with my office, continue to have constructive conversation with stakeholders and regarding next steps. Thank you. The Honourable Member from churchill kiwatanuk Aski. Mr. Speaker, this government is always ready to take a dive for big cities, but refuses to pass the ball to Indigenous and Northern youth, giving $104 million for six games of the FIFA World Cup in Toronto, but not making room for soccer in Indigenous and Northern communities is offside. In regions like ours, soccer is more than a game. It's a life-saving pass for kids. Canada has a responsibility to include all our youth in the lead-up to the 2026 World Cup, or we'll get a red card. So, Mr. Speaker, when will this government stop dribbling the ball in circles and find a way to include Indigenous and Northern youth as we all host soccer on the world stage? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government announced last week an investment of $220 million to host the FIFA World Cup Games right. in Vancouver and Bravo. Toronto. Bravo. This will generate economic impact, Mr. Speaker, of $2 billion for our country. That's a return on that investment, Mr. Speaker. And so it brings to the end of question period today, and I know all members will be very interested in this. I wish to draw the attention of members to the presence in the gallery of the finalists for the 2024 Shaughnessy Cohen Prize for Political Writing. Rob Goodman. Benjamin Perrin. And John Vaillant.